Toki, welcome to the Day Job Hacks YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. Today, I'm happy to have two guests on the channel here from Rev Content Native Ads Platform. I have Stephanie Reed here, as well as John Mitchell. Today, we're going to talk about how to scale your revenue using native ads, especially on Rev Content. Um, we have a bunch of questions here lined up, but you can also check inside the comments section, and we're going to have a timestamp of all the questions we're asking. And I encourage you to actually type any types of comments you have below, any questions, because we will be monitoring the, the chat afterwards. So if you have any questions that we didn't cover on this presentation, please feel free to do that. Also, any media buyers out there, affiliate marketers, anybody looking to scale their business, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like, comment, share. It helps us rank up in the search engines. And without wasting any more time, let's get started and I'll um, let you guys explain to me a little bit about Rev Content and how people can, you know, in increase their revenue using your platform. Uh, sure, I guess I'll start. I'm John Mitchell, I'm the director of sales over here. So I head up the uh, rep side of the business, the advertiser side of the business. You're probably familiar with my team when you're going through general onboarding, you're finally starting to reach out to the company, get a little more insight. So our team represents that and step over here is one of our senior account executives. Um, in a nutshell, what RevCon does is offer affiliates, editorial guys, brands, and the like an opportunity to um, access traffic, meaningful traffic through a series of um, platform related targeting options, insights that we can deliver from our account management team and reps alike, and just our general experience working with advertisers of, you know, anything from CBD oil to auto diabetes, digestion over to editorial and brands. Um, so lots of insight. We like to give as much of that as possible to our advertisers to get them set up for success long term. So I've been running native ads for many years, and I'm sure a lot of people watching this channel have also been running native ads for many years, especially on Rev Content. Can you tell me a little bit more about what new things you guys have been doing at Rev Content? What's changed since the past? I know a lot of things have changed in tracking. Native ads um, in themselves change frequently every year. So maybe you can Tell us a bit more about what's what's new over there. Yeah, this is kind of this is a huge question. I'll I'll go first. And I'll let Steph dive into some of the, the the details with regards to advertisers. But I think on a macro scale, Rev Content kind of looked into itself to understand what we've been doing correctly, and more importantly, what we haven't been doing correctly, particularly for our advertisers. I think pre two years ago or so we were heavily focused on new publisher acquisition as many as we could get as many as possible as much volume as we could generate cpms ecpms that was like the name of the game we took a step back and we're like all right what are we really doing here where does it all start like where does our story start for these advertisers what do they care about uh, and number one is quality publishers i mean that quality publishers lead to quality performance right or high performance so we removed almost 60% of our publisher base just by looking at their performance and more importantly, how often advertisers would actually optimize into them. By that, I just mean selecting publishers to bid into more and more over time. So they were gone. Um, so obviously from a revenue standpoint as a business, that was a huge hit, but there were, we, we were left no choice. It's either guys listen to your audience or listen to your clients or you're not growing at all. So we're just like, all right, Let's do it, kind of cut the legs below the knees and said, all right, we're going to rebuild. And then ever since then, we've taken an approach that considers the needs of our advertisers. If you've been with us for a little while, maybe you've seen one of our surveys where we're outright asking you, what can we do better? What have we done a terrible job doing? Uh, how, easy it, and how easy and intuitive is our technology? Is it even possible to optimize the way that we see that as being a, an op opportunity for you guys? So. Um, with constant feedback and just uh, the knowledge that we know what our advertisers want, we've readopted and reframed Rev Content as an opportunity for advertisers to scale and develop a relationship and partnership with a medium by or an agency such as ourselves. Nice. Yeah, I think you covered it well. It's one of our favorite, I think, stories to tell because it was like that 2015, 16, 17 age of like slap anything online and make money. And it was like, we're like raking it and we're having a great time. And then we had to just like take a step back for a minute and be like, okay, what quality and what do we want to be known for a brand of as? So with the onboarding and evaluation of our publisher base and the quality that we had there, it was ripping the bandaid off and it did impact advertisers who still wanted to run a questionable food image talking about how to cure diabetes. So <laughs> advertisers did feel this impact, but long run and the long play here was really feeding into their 
uh, their feedback. Like what, what is our platform missing? We didn't even have widget placement bidding. You didn't have that option. We didn't have fraud protection. They didn't have that. We didn't have any sort of robust API tools that they could measure and optimize traffic. So there was a ton that we had to do, but we're in a place now that it's like exciting to get people back and be like, look, look at us now, like give us more. Like that's sort of like what we work, operate and breathe on is just like the feedback of the actual people spending on our platform and in the weeds. Yeah. So from my experience from running in the past, a lot of changes have happened that have, have actually helped. Um, and, and for example, we have the, the, the pacing where now before you would set up a campaign, you would, you know, set up a thousand dollar budget, we'll say, and within a few hours, your, your traffic was spent across multiple of these placements that you probably just mentioned that you eliminated because um, the, the quality was was poor. And this is not something that was just specific to rev content at the time. It was something new in the industry a few years ago where things have evolved around ad fraud, okay? So we all know there's, there's bad placements out there that are using these publishing tools to be able to put their ads on their website at the same time, milking in the revenue with fake clicks. So by the sounds of it, you guys have made an effort to fix that. Can you expand a bit more on some of the things that you've done to help improve the quality of traffic to to bring better results for brands and and offer uh, owners and all that kind of stuff, affiliates as well? Yeah, I think that's pretty layered. I know like John can probably go into more of like the softwares and fraud protection that we've onboarded. I know from an advertiser standpoint, it was really important that we were transparent with our traffic. A solo unit or a app unit push unit is going to warrant entirely different bidding and content strategies than a traditional native placement. What we found was by lumping all these together, they, they serve impressions differently. They perform differently. The traffic volumes vary drastically. So lumping them in to just one pool of supply where it is transparent to them, but they don't really have the option to segment them out and change their strategies was actually hurting them and hurting us and our partners in the long term because it was just a lack of education and transparency. So that was, I think, the biggest step, John, I think you would agree was just being like, okay, we're going to segment traffic types, number one. So you have the option to opt into a particular traffic type. And number two, we're going to make it 100% transparent. There's no reason why we wouldn't, especially with the cleanup of the network. We're pr- proud to show you every single domain, widget, and publisher that is associated with any traffic you get. That's yeah. a good point because, I mean, before it was all widget IDs, right? So you would have like these numbers and you had to crunch the numbers. Now you can see the domains, you can see where your traffic's coming. And that makes a huge difference for advertisers, especially people that want to scale big um, when you see that transparency. Um, when you talk about the ad types, you're talking about push and native specifically, I believe. Can you explain it quickly um, for the people that aren't familiar with those, what the difference is between the push and native that you have available? Yeah, I mean, push is a very simple concept. When you land on a site, you get a push notification that says, are you willing to accept push notifications? And basically, from an advertiser standpoint, it's an opportunity to inject like a little one-liner saying you'll be updated with the following or you'll get information on the following, whatever the case may be. It's a very, very, very different ad type and strategy than native in general. And our bread and butter is native. So most affiliates listening to this uh, recording are going to say, all right, yeah, we're more interested and focused on affiliate offers. But if you want to delve into the push notification side of things, we're more than happy to educate you long-term and help you get started in that capacity. But the bread and butter is going to be native all the way. So now that we have a little overview about rev content and what you offer the native and push ads, um, can you, maybe we can talk quickly about how people can see success and how to get started with campaigns, what, what's working now in terms of uh, people like affiliates, not only affiliates, but we're talking, you know, e-com brands, maybe. Um, maybe we can start with like, what is a good strategy uh, for people getting started in and what's working right now? Sorry, I know that's a tough question because it's yeah. very broad, but what is working? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a rabbit hole here. I know. <laughs> 
yeah start i know somebody's run. asking like what 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 should i run what should... look i realize people want to make money quickly and i'm going to do we're going to do the best job we possibly can to get you prime to do exactly that and i think i'll do ourselves a huge disservice if, if i don't cover one of the most important factors when you start thinking about launching any kind of native campaign if you're an affiliate and that is based is just doing research on the offer that you want to launch what is the offer do you have a background in the offer are you able to communicate that offer effectively or that brand effectively are you able to pivot on some of the fundamental knowledge and studies or um in market information that's available to describe that because ultimately what you're doing is you're post an advertisement on the network that you want to generate interest through, right? You want to, you want to cause enough motivate motivation for these users to click on that ad. So the more dynamic you can be with your descriptions of that product, the better. And the only way you can be dynamic is to fully understand that product in the first place. Everything that follows that is basically secondary. And we have a million different recommendations that follows that. But number one, best piece of advice is to understand your offer. Yeah. And to echo that, it's like, who I can go you? into, yeah. There's, you like sp sped up super quick because you were glitching and then it was like your voice was like sped up by like two seconds. So it was just like moving so fast. Um, but yeah, exactly that. Like I think the biggest thing is having a strategy in place and knowing your risk tolerance. Obviously, if someone comes to us and they're like, what's working? We have that insight. We can give them vertical specifics. We can give them benchmarks, CPCs and CTRs to get them started and position them to tap into the most competitive pockets of traffic on the network on the onset. So they have enough reasonable data to scale out and see the majority. With that though, are you an affiliate who wants to spend a hundred dollars and pause if it doesn't work? Are you looking at adplexity and ripping what landing pages and creatives you can find? That almost all it, I mean, sure, some people can get lucky, but almost always the people with the strategy, the content angles, the the intuition on their offer and knowing and working closely with their performance network even are the ones that ultimately see the longer term success. That's a very good point because yeah. um, we talked about that before in, in some of the other videos on this channel about the rip and run approach is, uh, you know, it's good for getting ideas and stuff, but really the biggest players and the people that are making, you know, the 5,000 or spending five, $10,000 a day are people that are getting these offers before they've been beaten to death. They're, they're coming up with their own marketing angles and strategies, and then they're launching and testing. And they're not, like you said, stopping after a hundred dollars a day. Um, saying, ah, this doesn't work. I'm out of here. Um, so with that being said, what does it take and, and maybe explain your, your, your team and how you can help new people and what it takes uh, for them to continue with the, the dedicated support that you offer? Um, do you have to spend a hundred dollars a day or do you have to show merit? Do you, what is it that um, qualifies us to, to work directly with you so that we can get that insight that really matters um, in the long run? I think, yeah, the monetary value of your volume is one thing, but the volume itself is the most important thing to start considering from the get-go. And then when you're looking at volume, obviously you want it to be as meaningful as possible. And the real way to do that is we touched on strategy early where we mentioned the word strategy, but I want to kind of toy with that a little bit and break it apart. Strategy when entering rev content for long-term success means coming to the table with the basics in, in, in place. And the basics are, you know, three to five creatives activated within a campaign. If it's the first time you're launching that can, campaign, make sure they're completely varied creatives. They're all different from one another. When you start seeing performance for one or two of those creatives, you can break them into additional campaigns and you can start variable testing the image and the headline against each other. So ultimately you come up with one or two creatives that perform really well rinse and repeat with a new set of creatives. So ultimately over time, you end up with three, four, five, six, or dozens of campaigns for one singular offer that tap into different audience bases. Because let's face it, one image, um, one audience is gonna have the propensity to click on one image where another audience is gonna have the propensity to click on a totally different image. They might even be unrelated, but it goes to the same offer. So understanding that fundamental concept behind scaling and the basics of scaling is really, really important. And then uh, the second layer that we, we can add strategically is understanding your CPC benchmarks and C or uh, CTR benchmarks. In order to get served on any high performance widget, number one, your, your bid is going to be the thing that gets you there when you don't have an established CTR. 
So aim high on your startup bids. It doesn't have to be for a week. It can be an hour to 24 hours, maybe even less. It doesn't matter. If you see the volume and that CTR develops, bam, you can start reducing your, C or your CPC accordingly. Um, so that's kind of the fundamental strategy that we have in place. And then, of course, that just backs into having a solid understanding of the offer that you're representing. So about the algorithm, um, let's confirm oh, here something here. Um, so we're talking about CTR, ad CTR, which is, is I'm going to use an example that I just set up. I set up a campaign actually about four days ago on your platform in preparation of this, just so I could have some uh, more insight because it's uh... anyway. So I set up a campaign around pain relief. OK, set up about five ads. And one of the ads came through that was about 0.15% CTR. The other ones were below 0.03, okay? That one ad started serving more than all the other ads. Um, is it also a fact that with better CTR, you get cheaper click costs with your algorithm and that I should focus on that one ad and start developing ads similar to that to get that CTR and remain above, we'll say 0.1%. Is that a good strategy in terms of ad delivery? I think obviously the CTR is the bread and butter, right? It's the lever of, uh, it's the lever that you can't control, but you're trying to gain and maintain so that you can control your CPC. Obviously the higher CTR, yes, you should be able to get cheaper clicks because you're going to be more competitive in the ECPM, ECPM ad stack to determine to serve you or not. What I always say is also when you're in this strategy phase, you're obviously your number one thing is to try to get those clickable ads, headlines, creatives, maintain a CTR that is going to give you a CPC that you can maintain long term and actually go green versus the latter where it's like you're constantly competing with a higher CT or CPC because your CTR is lower. So you can make money off it, but it's going to be very short lived if you're paying 70 cents. That said, I also say the, the creative strategy is awesome. And like, that's the goal here, but also what's the landing page CTR? Like those are other things that you should look at. Is your, do you have a high clicking ad because it's interesting and people are clicking on it, but it doesn't really resonate with the page. And so the bounce rates higher, or they're not actually going through the funnel because you had a really good image and headline, but nothing else is enticing to them on the page. So it's a layered, it's a layered approach. First is that creative. You have to get that exposure on the network to even determine the landing page behaviors. But then also if that one creative has a way lower landing page CTR than something that you ran with a different headline image that has 0 .5, 0 0.05 CTR, but has a way higher landing page CTR, you know, it's a give and take. How are you sort of gonna break that out and split test it even further? That makes complete sense because the one that had the higher CTR, the ad, I could see why it got high CTRs because it's kind of mysterious, right? So people just click on it, but when they get there, they don't see yeah, yeah. what they want, right? So they leave. Um, so what I did was I tested having that same ad, but actually putting a picture of the product as well in the little corner of that picture so that they know when they get there, there's what congruency. There, okay, I know I'm clicking here and I'm going to see this product instead of what is it? And then I click there and then they just bounce anyway. Yeah. So it is a balance between, you know, good ads and, and good landing pages. Well, the, the word is continuity. It just has to right. exist. Yeah. Continuity. There has to be continuity. I to it it all the time. For an people, official, official definition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, people turn it into like a sport on the in the platform. It's like, I gotta get the CTR. I gotta get the CTR. <laughs> hey, I've got a high CTR, but I don't have any conversions. I'm like, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're talking yeah. about oh, aliens in your ad, and you're trying to sell diabetes, uh, whatever, in your on your landing page. So, I mean, there has to be that continuity in right. order for it to work. But all the reps here, we are not going to be shy about pointing that out, and we will ask you about your landing page if we see fit. Um, but I also want to make it clear that we're not able to tell you how to set up your your landing page. We're going to tell you if there is no continuity. Sorry to use the word once again. But we'll tell you, and then we'll ask you if you're split testing. We'll ask you if you're optimizing that end of the funnel because you have to. If we're going to deliver high performance traffic, it needs to be going to a high performance funnel. Yeah. Um, speaking about landing pages quickly, what do you find is most successful? Are you looking at, are you, are you seeing more listicles, more advertorials, or more video sales letters? What, what do you think um, works best in this kind of con context? Um, again, one of those questions that could probably be answered a million ways, but 
generally speaking, we'll say. Yeah, I, I'm always like, I always get this question and I'm, I feel like it's always a super high level answer, but in reality, I'm always like, Hey, look, we're a traffic source. We're not a marketing agency. We're, we're not going to media buy like for your ad to optimize your landing page. It's sort of on you, but we do know and see that the people who are split testing both actually act, can scale better long-term. Um, I, and it's very seasonal too. I'm sure, you know, being in that space for a long time, we see a ton of listicles come up in Q4 and into Q1. We see advertorial shift for the same exact offer more from like a testimonial approach to a long form. And then they'll do the VSL where they have the VSL, but Hey, there's a pop-up. So you're not just sitting here waiting for a video to read a transcript. There's actual like strategy that goes into that, um, that we see a wide variety. And there's so many variables that go into like what actually is going to work that we don't, we don't see, we don't have transparency to, but I would say for the most part, the pages that are genuine to continue a content discovery, that client's journey is what works rather than like a direct link to a homepage where they read an article and now they go to a homepage with all these sort of links and they don't really know where to go where to find a product or straight to a trial page where they're like, okay, like, I read a headline image and now they're asking me for my credit card information and telling me this is a free trial. Those just aren't going to resonate with the type of audience that we're supplying. Yeah. They'll be savvy to that pretty quickly. Users these days, we have like, we can put the blockers on for ads so easily. Um, so it's really, really important to, under, you know, native in and of itself is just that it's native. You don't really know you're in a sales funnel until you're at the sales page. And then at that point, if you've done a good job, you're like, well, this is a no brainer. Yeah. You know? You've gone through so many other things yeah. up to now. You're like, why quit now? I may as well break out the card. And well, I'm here and it's auto populated and whatever. Uh, yeah, exactly. And when people ask me, they're like VSL or advertorial or listicle. I'm like, test them all always. Yeah. Because the way it works is there's going to be a top advertiser. You're going to use your spy tools. You're going to look at their phone and you're going to be like, bam, that's what I got to do too. Sure, you can do that, but know for sure that it's being done on a grand scale if you've just discovered that advertiser. So you want to be the one that's pivoting and doing something slightly different. At least a small portion of your testing should be dedicated to trying brand new things like that. That's going against the obvious grain. Mm. So we talked about direct marketing or direct response. What I also see a lot of when I'm surfing the internet are these pages designed for ads. In other words, native arbitrage. Is that still a thing? Is it still big? Uh, I see big, huge companies doing it. Do you still see it on the smaller scale with people spending, uh, you say four figures a day on, on this type of thing? And can you comment on it, what, what it is, how it works? Yeah, I, I can do a high level. Um... ARB is a, it's editorial content, we call it. So it's, it's, it's all of those ads that you see top of mind is like, where are 90s kids now? That kind of thing. They're just monetizing the traffic through um, any kind of advertising service, including ourselves. Our own widgets would be on that lander too. And you're just trying to get people to run through a slideshow as a common example of, you know, 20 to 30 slides. They're optimizing based on the depth by which each user is able to make it through the slideshow. That's the basic premise of editorial content. And yeah, it's extremely competitive, but we're, what we're seeing now is the content is becoming a lot more or a little more realistic. It's a little less super clickbaity. Um, some of the great advertisers are able to sort of stay right there in that gray area where it's like, ah, oh, that's a little cringy, but it's also super interesting. I need to see what's over there. Right. And they're getting, most of the time they're getting paid on the impression anyway on that side. Um, so yeah, it's as many people as they can drive into that site and they get paid more based on how many, how many slides that user is able to make it through. It's interesting. Cause I, yeah. I, being a marketer myself, I see it and I know what it is and I still click on it. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do too. I guarantee, I guarantee I have clicked on one of our ads in the network in the last seven days. Um, that's just the nature of it. Honestly, it's the nature of it. If I, if I, if I don't outright believe it, I have to check it just so I can vet it myself and see, yeah. it, you know, but that's, that's the draw of it. That's the appeal of it. That's why it works. So that's a whole different beast in itself is that, uh, you know, page view, trying to get people to get page views and 
but I, I do see it all the time. And I still wonder, like, I've never done it myself, but I've always thought about combining direct response as an affiliate with that kind of ad mesh, we'll say. So saying uh, something like new pain breakthrough, whatever that everybody must try. This is not a headline I would use, but just as an example, then I send them to a page with a bunch of AdSense ads and your widgets and stuff. But at the same time, my article is all about this product that could help them. So you kind of get a double chance of getting somebody to click on the ad while at the same time, maybe buying the, the affiliate product. I've never tested it, but it was a theory that I thought might be worth testing one day. Um, yeah, uh, that falls into what I would say, advertorial type of funnel. You know, if you're the beautiful funnels that we see are the ones that have, have an ad that's really appeal, that's, that's either mysterious or factual or leads to a listicle that's really helpful. That's like, how oh, I can be a better person by looking at this thing. And you get there and you're confounded, you're, you're the, the information delivery, whether it's VSL or the actual advertorial, it tells you it offers value, which is a really fundamental part of these successful funnels is there is value on the other side of that clip. So people are bought in with that value. And then what you choose to do with their buy-in is up to you. Um, so if you're set on delivering content, making that like your, your shining light, your bat signal, then by all means do it. That's what the great advertisers or affiliate advertisers are capable of doing. But they insert their product or range of products in a way that's subtle enough not to sort of give it away, you know, I but available enough to transition. The best example that I can think of that comes to mind is like that very editorial content approach, but still considered advertorial would be like the Motley Fools of this space. They are yeah. brilliant at, you know, at an enticing headline of Elon Musk X, blah, 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 YZ. Um, and they actually have documentation. It's a long form content sort of page where at the end they have different, obviously, monetization effort of either like subscribe by just right. the website, listen to the pod, like all of that. So they, or any of the Agoras actually are really good at it too. Like it, using those content angles, leveraging the industry, getting people in contextually and then monetizing them. Yeah, absolutely. I found the best results um, when I ran Casino. Uh, I ran it for probably a year or two on your platform, um, doing push and native. That if I would target my landing pages to specific events or my ads to specific events in the world, like headline news stuff, and using those angles and putting it into my story somewhat, um, I was getting the best results because people are constantly absorbing information. And when it looks like something new and fresh, they're just like, click, click. Yeah. Okay. What's this? It must be related to this and this. And so while, you know, you can sit there and run the same ads over and over, but if you're actively engaged in getting the most up-to-date content and changing and going with the times, I think you have a, a good chance of success here. Yeah. yeah. Sure. What are those trigger words right now? Anyone yeah. who's Dogecoin, everyone's going to click. Right. Anyone no, that's says, a good you know, example. Those industry uh, like cat catchphrases are huge. Right. When you mentioned Motley Fool, I follow them on Instagram. And on Wednesday, there was like a, a big crypto crash because Elon said something about the viability <laughs> of the energy consumption of Bitcoin, something like whatever it was. And then uh, Motley Fool, like, Total crazy. by the end of the day they're like here's why there's a crash and here's why you need to get into it right away and i'm like oh i need to go check this out really quick you know yeah. Um, yeah. great example of being relevant to the times yeah to close that loop even or even a segue let's talk about ad fatigue and how important that is like on yeah. a native platform especially using these angles will prevent that the best like the algorithm is going to serve to engagement when you lose engagement that's what we would consider fatigue. Mm -hmm. So change, put a catchphrase in the headline, change it up a little bit, keep things fresh. So you're not in the end having to crank up that CPC and see red. Right. Yeah. So how yeah. long would you say an ad normally performs well before it's time to switch it out? Are you talking months, weeks, days? Um, like if you have a good ad? Uh, it entirely depends on how much exposure you're getting in the first place. Right. But um, I, I say keep a pulse on it weekly minimum, 
jump right. in there and keep an eye on those impressions, the impact. Like even sometimes if your seat chair is going up, but your impressions are going down, like that's also a good indication. Like, okay, I'm tapping into a solid, you know, pocket of traffic, but my overall impressions are going down. Let me add more creatives. You don't want to also concentrate and like totally fatigue that certain pocket of traffic either. So it's, I say more, the better is what I personally say. We continually see that people continually pump new creatives with just a word variant headline are the ones who can maintain volume at reasonable CPCs. Yeah, and I would even ask at the beginning, did you rip the creative? Did you rip the image or the headline? Because to cover that really briefly, if you're using the same creative that's already seen performance in the network, our algorithm is already gonna know that so you're going to be pitted against that creative for a brief moment in time and if it doesn't um eventually outperform it's just going to be dropped back into our stack and you're never going to see that growth that you want but if you're developing original new creatives that are somewhat similar but not identical then you'll get longer exposure to that top performing creative and eventually you might even take it over with the top spot mm -hmm. that's why new original creatives are so important to your entire campaign stack uh so i was on your blog this morning and i saw an interesting article about tommy chong cbd and it made me think uh, wow, that's amazing. They, they had an increase of 533% profitability or something like that. Um, and they talked about their strategy. I recommend anybody watching this video to go check out that post on Rev Content. It talks about um, the tools they used to connect API, which Bra uh, Brax.io was the tool they used. Um, where I'm going with this is, first of all, CBD in itself is just one of those examples of why native ads are so attractive to affiliates is because you try and run CBD on Facebook or Google, it's like, bye-bye, see you later. You're gone for life. Your business is over. Um, native ads is different where publishers are a little more um, lenient on what we can run, which is awesome. And that's what I, I love about running native ads. Um, so are you seeing other affiliates doing similar stuff in, in a space like that? Or is it, do you need to have a brand and a big brand? What's, what's better in, in terms of branding? Should we go as an affiliate and try and try all these different offers or should we stick to particular brands and, and focus on that? Shout out Tommy Chong. <laughs> um, I would love to have access Tommy to his Chong. offer and run it myself. <laughs> <Poor but. John. laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, uh, the brand, um recognition and the endorsement of tommy chong was huge for them and in no doubt pivotal pivotal in their success that they had and then additionally the api is just a game changer it was for them they're not manually trying to tweak things and stay on top of things they're lenient and flexible with their rules in the beginning and then they let the algorithm do the work and the api um in terms of in a affiliate approach or aspect like sticking with one offer or brand or trying to expand and see what sticks i think that all goes back to like that really vague high level answer um and john i know that you've worked primarily more with the uh, in the affiliate space versus like the in, in the webinars you've already done so you probably are better suited to understand what kind of questions they're already asking on that front. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tommy Chong, other than, you know, Tommy Chong being Tommy Chong and extremely well known. I mean, we're talking to go back a little bit. We're talking about extreme cultural relevance. I mean, you can't really go to any newspaper at all right now without seeing something related to cannabis going on, whether it's like legalization in Virginia or non legal, whatever's happening. There's, there's vi and the science being released behind CBD as well. So it's riding a wave of popularity right now. It's only getting bigger and bigger over time. So they have a few variables at play with them. They're integrated with the API, which is a very, very smart move. Um, by having rules in place, all we mean is they have a floor and a ceiling on their CTR. If it goes too high on a CPC, they, they maybe uh, lower it, or if uh, the CTR goes too low, maybe they'll increase the CPC or delete the widget altogether. That's all we mean. And they're just very, very good at that. They've been doing it for over 12 months, I know for sure. Um, but what's really important about them is the, the way that they're delivering content through a well-recognized spokesperson. They're able to bridge this gap between science and popularity and culture. So they're much, much more than just a product. A lot so, is actually happening for them. I guess my question was a little broad. Could an affiliate 
replicate the same success in CBD without the brand of Tommy Chong? Or do you see it happening now uh, at a mass scale like that? Yeah, that this these will be speculative answers for sure. But yeah, I think so 100%. I think if somebody were to nail down the science behind CBD or find some really, really solid case studies or academic studies and start highlighting the benefits in, a, in sort of like a glorious and fantastic or even a mysterious or fear of missing out kind of way, you know, hacks for your body or hacks for athletes, whatever. There's so much content you can build over scientific facts or the studies behind CBD at this moment um, that have advertised already were, were to spend some time digging that stuff up and then building really effective one-liners around that. Yeah, I totally think there could be a lot of success there. Yeah, I think too, having the insight from us saying like, hey, if you want to run CBD, um, like gummies, for example, is a good angle. Uh, know that you're going to have direct competition. Tommy Chong runs direct with us. They're aggressive. If you want to take up some, if you want to eat some of that lunch, you're going to have to, you know, hurt a little bit to win that traffic. So what, how much, how long are you willing to try to go up against that supply with different angles, maybe a gummy instead of an oil, maybe, you know, a, a, a pain relief angle instead of a, you won't believe the health benefits angle or anxiety sleep, you know, it, how long are you able, or like with us being transparent with this direct competition, you are going to have to hurt a little bit to get that supply. So you're not going to do it with a hundred dollar a day budget. You're not going to do it with a hundred dollars a day budget. Right. <laughs> you're so, not going to do it with two or three hundred dollars a day. Right. Or, I mean, exactly. So you get, you better be ready to spend crazy if you're ready if you want to get that data up front and start making the changes. And I guess that leads into that tool that we were talking about because a lot of the features that um, people like to use, for example, one in particular is day parting. Um, I noticed that that's not in the platform itself, but with a tool like Brax.io, you can schedule your ads uh, for specific times of the day. I'm sure they're doing that I, um, at, at, uh, with the campaign we were just speaking of. Um, you can adjust your bids on the fly at the widget level. If you see one working that's not, um, or one that's working, you can increase it on the fly. It's all in real time. Um, so, um, do you recommend people use that tool? I know it's affordable. Um, it's only $200 a month for $10,000 a day spend. I think I would use it myself if I wanted to go against a big brand like that. But what do you think? Yeah, undoubtedly, if you want to go big, you need an optimizer in place. You just need it. Yeah. Um, which isn't to say that you can't do some damage, good damage um, on your own manual bidding. But eventually you get to a point where scale becomes an issue. Just the time in a day. And you need an auto optimizer. So the sooner you're familiar with an auto optimizer, the better. That's the way I see it. Right. Because you give us the tools to bid at a widget level. But when you go into the data, there's like 400 widgets, we'll say, sitting there or 400 placements. Um, who wants to sit there and start tweaking each single one? I mean, it's fine at first because you find the big ones and you're like, okay, that one I want. Um, but with your team and your, and your uh, ad reps, we'll call them, would you be able to help us find more placements similar to the ones we find ourselves and say, Hey, we can fix this for you and, and, and help you out here. Yeah. Is that what your team does. I think what's important to note here is auto optimizer is a route you want to take when you're like, I'm going to take this network over. It doesn't mean it's impossible to take out to, to win really, really strong positions across the network on your own dime, on your own uh, time, just yourself. Because we do, in fact, have account managers and reps in place to help you sort of will become your auto optimizer. You know what I mean? In a way, um, we'll help you identify those high performance pockets and you can replicate campaigns targeting those high performance pockets over and over and over again and start setting up what we call mining campaigns to identify additional widgets to add into those original campaign pockets. So there is a very, very well um well-tested strategy at play if you can't use an auto optimizer, um, which is our AM team and our rep experience. Yeah, there is with those optimizers too, there is, and I'm sure you know, in the native space, power in real time data. 
Rev content is the fastest data reporting. I think it's within, it is real time. You're never gonna see more than a 20 minute lag in any data. We're not dealing with those three hour lag times. That said, how important is it when you see an engaged pocket of traffic? These are site target, like you're targeting sites. You're not targeting pers like individual, like particular user demographics. So in that real time, if you see engagement on a particular placement, it's powerful to be able to, you know, floor it on that certain placement, have the algorithm decide to allocate and prioritize that placement. And then likewise, if something falls off, reduce the bid in real time on that placement and be able to make those adjustments in real time. Because there are so many times where, you know, you spend a hundred dollars the first day, you're like, yeah, I got like four conversions. This is going to be great. I'm going to open it up day two. You're like, I got like one conversion. It wasn't, it was only on like one of the same widgets, but it's like, there's power in that real time analytic and optimization as well when you hit scale and for sustainability. Interesting because, um, yeah, I've seen that a lot where you're running and it's, you start out and you're like, yes, this is great. <laughs> exactly. I'm gonna be rich. And then all of a sudden the next day, like you said, clockwork, it's like, was that a fluke? What happened? So what is actually happening there? Uh, 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 is your algorithm testing us on the best placements? And then, okay, well, that one didn't compare to this guy. So we're going to put him back over here. Or what, what is happening? Should we go in and bid up on those ones right, right away? Is there something that we're doing that could improve our chance of success? Yeah, we can probably tag team that one. I know right off the bat, our algorithm isn't ever going to be like, you got a conversion here, let me serve you more. It's literally going to say, this is where the engagement is and this is where your ad should live. So if you're, you are, you know, bidding just enough to get a little bit of traction, but there is no bid adjustment to increase and say, yes, algorithm, you're right. This engagement is converting. I want to serve here. And then the vice versa algorithm, there's engagement, but the conversions aren't there. Like I'm going to reduce the bid without those bid changes, the algorithm is just going to serve you to engagement, performance, engagement, and that's it, which is something that we like to really hone in on out the onset of testing. And when you say engagement, do you mean click through rate? That's it. The CTR and yeah. the CPC combo is where it's going to serve you. So another question, do you have a setting in there that says target CPA, right? It you used to say that. I think we changed that wording because it was confusing. Okay. But so what is that? Do you, do you do that anymore where you can target a certain CPA and let the algorithm do its thing? Or is that something... That is an, a conversion pixel for us to have the analytic insight to, like you said, have our AM team jump in and collaborate with you for lookalikes, um, identify placements that you may have fallen off on that you were converting on previously and give us a general idea of where you're performing. Okay. Yeah. If you have a CPA goal, we can just do the math based on the conversions you're generating. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. And in the world of affiliate, they don't like to share that information. So we're also, that is another thing with the, like we like to make clear, like you don't necessarily, as long as it's placed and we can see where those are firing and you can articulate with best performance, that's the most important thing. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of affiliates are very skeptical on giving away data, especially when there's so much competition. There's so many other eyes on your campaigns. We talk about that all the time in our community. And it's just the nature of our industry is that we are already at the bottom of the barrel, it seems sometimes. So if we can protect as much data as possible. However, uh, with that being said, I've become a little less paranoid over the years and realizing you could know everything about a campaign and still not make it because you need to have the right people. And it's more about relationships with people, knowing what's working and testing and getting your own data. You can rip and run all day long, but you're never going to make it um, grand scale without good yeah. relationships. So sharing data is important. I've, I've finally discovered in the end, it took me a while, but. The more, and for us, our new like shiny development is, literally the power behind our AM team, miracle workers. They're the ones that if you are transparent with your data, you have invested data, you're willing to test and 
take recommendations, they are the pivotal, like they are the element to make it happen and the insight to give you the strategic edge and competitive insight to perform on the network long-term. With that said, it is sort of an exclusive service to particular players that have reached a certain level of testing and immersement in the platform because we don't want to dilute that value that they can bring because it is a lot of time and that value is really beneficial to the advertiser. And you can probably speak more on the AM team. I can't speak enough about them. Like it's a huge part of what makes our partners successful. And I don't yeah. know that the, the it's thing about, off of Yeah, totally agree. The, the thing about them and try to sort of echo your last point, um, when you're getting this insight, you need to be okay with getting insight that you're not going to be over the moon about. If we're like your CPC is just straight up too low, if the Tommy Chong example, though, you need to put auction pressure. This is an auction. It's a real-time auction. You need to put pressure on them. So you max out their rules. So their rule says, I've got a, I've got a ceiling of 45, 50 cents. I can't go any higher. If you're the guy who goes 51 cents with a decent CTR, you've got that placement, which is obviously going to be a very, very high performance placement. Then the onus is on you to start taking control of your creatives, developing a high enough CTR to stay in that bracket, but also start paying a little bit less over time. And that is the sort of CTR CPC relationship our account management team is trying to mitigate or the risk that we're trying to mitigate for you. But sometimes we have to tell you exactly what's going on and you have to be able to see the forest for the trees and the, the grand scale of the opportunity. Sometimes you got to fight. Sometimes you can ride it out. Uh, so let's uh, kind of wrap this up quick, well, not quickly, but we'll, we'll, we'll start heading down the road of wrap up here. If I am a new person, I spend say $500 a day. I'm comfortable with spending that. How would I get started on rev content? And is that enough to get somebody to speak with or do I need to spend and prove myself? What's, what's the next steps for me as somebody that wants to start running? Yeah, I'll tell you right now, if you want to start with us, you can send us an email. Send me an email, john at revcontent.com, J-O-N. Um, oh, Stephanie awesome. at RevCon What's that? For those watching, there's also comments down below. You can, we can Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a pretty robust team of reps. We're always interested in onboarding new clients. We'll evaluate everything that you've got to offer when we get you set up for long-term scaling. Whether or not you move into account management is strictly based on the performance that you're seeing with us and that we're seeing with you. You know, it's a it's a partnership effort. If we're like, all right, we're going big here, we're gonna pass you on to the Oh, oh man. Awesome. He froze on us. <laughs> oh hey, I'm back. Okay. Watch all that. <laughs> that was, it was wow. like, oh, cliffhanger. We were, were doing so good. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. Um, yeah, all I meant to say was that, yeah, you can reach out to either one of us and we're happy to intro you to a rep. And ultimately, the, the whole plan is to get you guys set up for success from the get go. We're going to we're going to go through your campaigns with a fine tooth comb and give you the hard reality. If you've ripped most of your creatives, we're going to tell you you need more original creatives. If your bids are too low, we're going to tell you they're too low. And then we'll tell you why, because you're competing in a real time auction and you have to apply that pressure to win those placements. Long story short, let us give you the advice that we know works. Take that on board. If you're able to use it and build from it, we'll get you over to the account management team, too. That's awesome. Yeah. Did I freeze that time? No, no, that was good. Okay. Yeah, you got right <laughs> through that one. Yeah. Um, that's the thing. Uh, Native ads is one of those platforms that I think everybody needs to try, especially if you're one of someone like me who's lost about 25 Facebook accounts over the years. <laughs> right? um, and it's just so nice to wake up the next morning and know that your ads are running. You can have a coffee come down and be very certain that as long as you're, you know, not abusing any systems, you're going to have an ad account the next day and you can spend. But you, you, know, you earned that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You earned that, that right. you relax about it. You know, you didn't just show up one day and it worked. It's like that old Picasso story. He was drawing on a napkin in a cafe and someone came up to him and said, Hey, can I have that drawing? He said, no, it took me 20 years to develop the uh, ability to draw this little thing. You can't have it. Something like that. So it's like you put the effort in and yeah. you get the rewards and we're kind of here to help facilitate you understanding what that effort actually involves. That's awesome. I'm actually looking forward to scaling this pain relief one. It's uh, it's converted the first day, which made me pretty excited. And it converted on a video sales letter, which I've never ran on 
uh, rev content. I've never ran a video sales letter. I created the video, put it on a, a landing page, boom, like within $30 of spend, I got a conversion. Nice. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, now, if I can scale that, that'd be even better. That leads me to one more question before we wrap this up and I'll let you guys close out. Um, video ads, how do those work? Because I was thinking about putting a video on and, and seeing, is, is that, what, what is that? I haven't tried it. I'm like, uh, um, the video ads are unique in that you can use an actual video creative. It's on autoplay, but mute. So it's user sound enabled. It's only restricted to one panel within a specific widget on one of our sites or our publisher sites. And what's unique about them is generally they actually develop lower CTRs because of that autoplay sound enabled feature. However, the click to like the click through and the conversion rate seem to be higher because the people who actually do go are like, okay, I'm actually interested in watching this video and click through are yeah, more was... engaged. So, okay, so I'll go ahead if you're not done. No, they live and breathe and function just like your static image and headline would within the placement, but it's a video instead of a static image. Okay. So I'm on, uh, let's say food network or something. And I'm watching and because every time I go do a recipe, I see these things popping up everywhere. But um, so would I see it as a video that's playing, but no sound, or would I just automatically start hearing this video playing? And I'm like, where the hell is this go? Like, or what, with with our placements, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, I'm pretty positive I'm right on this one. It has to be viewable. So it has to be a, scrolled over within our widget placement, and it's the sound is muted, but it's on autoplay. So once the view is at least 50% of that video panel showing, it will start playing, and then the user can choose to enable the sound and listen. So it's not that, like, Oh my God, the, the recipe of like, this is my story. And then you're like trying to turn off like some NASCAR right. ad on the end, but you can't, <laughs> find it. So you're scrolling all over the page. Yeah. It's definitely not like that. So it makes sense that maybe to increase CTR, you would have something flashy in the start of your video. Cause they're going to see it and it's going to catch their eye. They're like, Whoa, what's that? Well, there well, it was subtitles the versus no subtitles. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's the opportunity. Whoever can start. Here's the thing, you always have to think about the, the experience in terms of the user journey. Is it just a video that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense? Should it be slow-mo? Should it be like fast and active? Or should it be a very like conceptual or abstract type of video? There's a lot of work to be done in figuring out what the best approach is for video. It's there and it's brand new. Um, and uh, not a lot of advertisers have been able to figure that out. And the ones that have are noticing higher CTRs when they actually get to their landing page. So it's definitely, a worthwhile opportunity, but you have to do the work and try and figure out what people are, are willing to click on. That doesn't look like an over traditional banner ad where it's like NASCAR and you're on a zoom call and things just go insane. <laughs> right. Well, uh, that was a super helpful video. I thought anyway, around native ads, how rev content can help us again, want to remind people that there will be comments below. You can ask questions. I'm sure you guys will be able to answer anything in there as well. If you guys want to close, give us a little overview or closing. Um, and then uh, maybe we'll just go enjoy our long weekend. Yeah, I guess I'll do, I'll do a quick, uh, a quick thing. I mean, because we've done this turnaround and invested so heavily in tech, it's an absolute pleasure to do this with advertisers now. It, all we ask in return is that advertisers are motivated to get to that place where they, where they see success. It's a journey that we can embark on together where it's like, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and lows and highs. But if you can stick with us, we can keep on delivering the information you need to get to that spot. Um, and then the onus is definitely on us to deliver publishers that are worthwhile. And that's kind of like the crux of the whole business. That's exactly what we're dedicated and focused on doing. So, you know, if you're hesitant, even hesitant about signing up, we're still willing to have a conversation. So just reach out and we're happy to have that conversation. All right. Well, thank you very much for being here. That was awesome. I appreciate you guys taking your time to come here, talk about your platform. I'll definitely be running some more ads there. Um, in fact, I'm running some right now. I'm going to refresh my stats here and hopefully see 10 or 15 conversions, maybe. <laughs> well, maybe not that many yet. <laughs> well, well, original creative. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now that I have so much knowledge. But anyway, thanks again. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. All right.